Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Today we're going to talk about splitting. It's an idea that's central to psychodynamic work and moves through most therapeutic modalities. Splitting is something that in small doses is normal. Adults split to make sense of complicated experiences when they're confused or threatened. We all notice this, that we tend to create camps in our way of thinking. Uh, Republicans versus Democrats, evil versus good, uh, the moral versus the immoral, and on and on. The early psychoanalysts noticed that splitting effectively reduces anxiety and helps maintain self-esteem. It can give us a superficial sense of the world and our place in it. And on that level, we have a tendency to create these very tight categories of good and bad things around us. We do it naturally as very young children, and we'll continue it in small ways. What can happen for some of us is that splitting can become the primary way that we create any sense of safety inside of ourselves. And then we find ourselves with a distorted sense of reality that can be rather dangerous, that we become so positioned on one side or the other that we're not even navigating the world very successfully or worse. So today today we're going to just take that up and try to explore it more fully. Uh, That's a good way to get us started, Joseph. And I I guess I'll jump in with a real quick, fast definition of splitting in the psychoanalytic sense. I'm just reading right from the Kaplan and Sadik Glossary of Psychiatry and Psychology, which was my one of my go to reference books in the early days of my training as a therapist. Splitting is a defense mechanism in which external objects, meaning people, are divided into all good and all bad, accompanied by the abrupt shifting of an object from one extreme category to the other. So when we're using this defense, and as you said, Joseph, it's it's totally normal, but the more extreme versions of it can definitely be problematic. When we're engaged in this primitive defense of splitting, we may idealize someone one minute, and then the next minute, the person's all bad. And this is a defensive structure that is typical of certain presentations, let's say. It's usually considered to be one of the primary defensive mechanisms of uh, someone who might have borderline personality disorder. 
So the complete devaluing of someone one minute and then the idealization of them the next. And Mm -hmm. this can show up in the consulting room too. I think it shows up uh, everywhere. I think everyone is familiar with how it looks out there in the world and hopefully how it feels uh, inside and personal experience. And I'm back on how essentially this is a defense mechanism. And we need our defenses when we feel threatened, as you mentioned, Joseph. However, defenses also are distortions. You know, things are not one or the other, good or bad, right or wrong. Uh, So it's a place where we retreat and regress into a very early stage of development, you know, when we are anxious or fearful. So the regressing reminds us that there was a time in human development where splitting was a reasonable way of making sense of the world from early infancy to, what is it, about two or three years old that we begin to start developing object constancy? Mm Mm-hmm. So when we're very, very young, we haven't yet developed a cohesive sense of our caregivers. It's as if we haven't quite developed a consistent memory of who our caregivers are. So each time the caregiver shows up, if the caregiver provides a pleasurable experience, the body of the child interprets this as pleasant and good and something they want a lot of. If the caregiver shows up and disappoints the child, perhaps doesn't feed them when they're hungry, or perhaps startles them in some way, there's no previous memory of the person in the way that we think of memory. Mm -hmm. And so the person suddenly becomes monstrous or terrible. Mm -hmm. And so our early experience bounces between these kind of strangers that keep walking in and out of the room, either pleasing or disappointing us. And so the early world is set up into these kind of polarities. And we can see this probably more readily in our own children, that the dog that's sweet, the pet that's sweet, the child feels really good towards, and the pet that barks, the child's thinks of as kind of a monster. And eventually one outgrows that and we develop a kind of cohesive memory that, well, the mother that disappoints me and the mother that sues me is the same person. And the dog that plays with me and the dog that startles me with barking is in fact the same dog. But we have to earn that process. Sometimes under enormous amounts of attention, we can slide back into this two-year-old way of perceiving the world, and we call that a regression. Yeah, I mean, Joseph, you've just given a really good uh, overview, I think, of Melanie Klein's theory. And Klein was a psychoanalyst who uh, worked in the Freudian tradition, and she is really sort of the queen of splitting. She's the one who really elucidated this idea and fleshed it out, as it were. And she um, (laughs) used this very colorful language to talk about it in her book, Envy and Gratitude. You know, she writes about the world being divided into good and bad objects. And she spoke about this in terms of the good breast and the bad breast. And it's just what you were saying, Joseph. And She says that in the beginning of life, we start off in the paranoid schizoid position, and this is where we experience our caregivers, for example, as either all good or all bad. And we feel very gratified when the good breast meets our need and needs, and we feel enraged when we can't control the so-called bad breast and get what we want. And uh, we are filled with love for the good breast, and we're filled with hatred for the bad breast. And these things, just as you were saying, are are completely separate. And this is necessary, Klein says, because a certain amount of splitting is essential for integration. We have to have this kind of conflict-free experience of the good breast for a little while 
to be able to integrate it and have a sense of there being an an internal, what, what Klein would say, an internal good object. And then when that gets built up a little bit, we can move into what she called the depressive position. So we recognize that mom has good days and bad days, and sometimes she's going to meet our needs, and sometimes she's going to disappoint us. And then we've moved into the depressive position, as I was saying, and part of what happens then is we must bear the anxiety of ambivalence. When I think about uh, Klein and remember my own infants, of course, we all know that infants do not have the cognitive capability to kind of think uh, along the lines that you just articulated, Lisa, about uh, ambivalence and mom has good days and bad days. An infant is dependent upon caregiving and gratification. So we start out in this very me-centered world of what I need. I need to be fed or held or whatever else will gratify my need. And so it takes a combination of a secure attachment to a caregiver that is present and satisfying for the most part, what Winnicott called the good enough mother in order to be able later uh, to come into this place of a strong enough budding little ego that can tolerate ambivalence and uh, this kind of painful adjustment to a reality of self and others that are imperfect and um, changing. So what I think about when adults go into uh, some place where it's split, is what what is so intolerable and what is so threatening that it creates this kind of regression to the all good or the all bad? And how do we develop enough ego strength uh, to be okay, even when that external world person or situation uh, it is not to our liking, and it could indeed be a really negative situation. But how do we not just automatically go into that defense? I just want to double back and reiterate something that I think you've both said, which is how normal this is. Mm. And, you know, you kind of regurgitate Klein, and it sounds like you get this figured out by the time you're two or something. <laughs> but I, I think we all have a tendency to see things as all good or all bad a lot of the time. And it's not even just when things are really terrible, but that if we think about it, if we think about, I don't know, when we get a little pinprick throughout the day, someone upsets us or angers us, immediately we can go to a spot where we tend to demonize that person. Well, we may not stay there very long, but I just want to lift up how normal it is. I think it happens for most of us, again, on a daily basis to revert to this view of the world where at least some part of it is all good and all bad. It's very, very difficult to tolerate ambivalence all the time. There is a split that we often go into between what we feel and what we think or the meaning that we make out of it. And, and that is a place where uh, I, I think it's almost instantaneous, you know, that somebody steps on our metaphorical toe and we immediately make meaning out of the feeling of what a jerk he was or, boy, that was dumb or something like that. And so I think I'm just really um, seconding uh you're saying that splitting is normal and it's something that we revert to almost automatically a lot of the time. And so what we're looking for, which I think you were uh, mentioning earlier, Deb, is some way to return to a more mature psychological stance ever more swiftly so we don't stay in that overly positioned place for a, a damaging amount of time. So the Three, the couple of dynamics that I'm thinking about is we have a tendency to split when we believe we're threatened. 
We have a tendency to split when we're confused, and we have a tendency to split when we're anxious. And all of those can also be happening at the same time, of course. So often our clear thinking and a demand to expand our memory of the object is a way of slowly working ourselves out of it. So when we're confused, somehow we're having trouble holding various data. It's hard for us to remember that, for instance, my boss was really kind to me last week. And it's hard for me to remember that, oh, I forgot he's going through a divorce. And so he's coming in short-tempered or probably under incredible amounts of stress. So by thinking back into the facts of the situation and adding information that has left the conscious field, we can begin to make person who we're upset with return to a three-dimensional object instead of a two-dimensional object. And that's, that's a kind of method we can use to work our way back into a more mature position. Another thing that we could do is to really evaluate the logic of the threat. Uh, many of us catastrophize and we exaggerate danger, which then causes us to split. So sometimes talking with a good friend who really challenges the way we're catastrophizing can also bring us, bring our feet back on the ground. And when our nervous system begins to exhale, we can also tolerate a more full picture of what is actually dangerous in the moment. Another that I might add is a sense of humor. That can help us put things back into proportion. Uh, as if we can look on the light side, put it in the context of the greater whole, and see just some humanity. I agree that all of these things can be useful in helping us return to a more um, tolerant, understanding viewpoint. I don't think it's very easy to do that, actually, mm -hmm. because the truth is it's very gratifying to split. <laughs> it feels so good to locate all of the bad out there. We see this a lot in the tenor of social media arguments where they, whoever they are, have it all wrong and are evil. And this brings up the fact that one of the things that goes along with splitting is projection. And this is why splitting is such a powerful defense because we take something in us that we can't tolerate, we locate it in the other, we see that the other carries it for us, and then we can disavow that person, we can excommunicate that person, we can denounce that person. And it's like we've done this incredible thing of getting rid of our ambivalence and completely containing it, at least for the time, so I'm going to make up a scenario here, okay, about a woman who has a difficult uh, seven-year-old, let's say, and she's been trying to manage this little boy, and then uh, some of the teachers say, well, we think he has ADHD. And she goes through the process of getting him evaluated, and it's recommended that he be put on medication and uh, let's say that this person's sister has expressed concerns about putting kids on ADHD medication. So the, the woman in question, this hypothetical woman, you know, is obviously scared and feels threatened and is worried about her child and wants to do the right thing and feels a certain amount of pressure to put the kid on medication in spite of her own misgivings about that or questions about that, let's say, then because she cannot live with the ambivalence of putting her kid on medication while not being sure that that's the right thing to do, she adopts a stance of certainty. She uh, locates all of her ambivalence in her sister and then becomes enraged at her sister 
for her sisters uh, lifting up this question about what do we know about the effect of these drugs on kids. So that, that's just a totally fictionalized, made-up vignette to show how this works. But it feels good. And, and so it isn't always so easy to walk it back. And I think we see this in collective life all the time. I mean, this is one of the main ways, unfortunately, that we deal with difference in collective life. The restoration of that sense of security, that we know what's happening in the world, that we're interpreting things correctly, even if truly we're distorting it, and that sense that we're in the right, we're in a kind of moral security is incredibly seductive uh, to all of us. Yes. I'm taking this in and uh, aware of really having a sense of sadness uh, about our collective life, uh, that, that this is in large part in our public discourse, social media, political parties, all the debate around the uh, coronavirus vaccine, um, that this is what we've come to, that this is in such large part where we are. Mm -hmm. And are we either that immature as a collective or that threatened and troubled that we have to resort to this kind of defense and that this is very much what's happening out there? And look what I just did. I said, out there, uh, I might well have asked myself, what about what's going on in me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just split. I just did the very thing we're uh, trying to uh, not do. <laughs> I think this leans into the central developmental task in Jungian work of bearing the tension of the opposites consciously. And what an incredible achievement that is for all of us and for us as analysts, for our analysands, to be able to tolerate first the knowledge that we're creating a false division, to be able to be aware of the two sides of it and to have the strength to suffer that split inside of us, which creates an enormous amount of anxiety and tumult. I think that all the work we're doing, and particularly dream work, is pushing us in that direction. Because I often think that it's in the dream that the part that we're both projecting and disavowing comes back to haunt us. And our dreams, if we can work with ourselves to recall them and record them, take them in and try to understand them, is a wonderful exercise in the personal development inherent in resolving the split between consciousness and the unconscious which I think is the great primal split uh, in adults. As we go about our day and we're busy and we do all kinds of things, we dream at night, we have no idea what we dreamt or what it means. And so consciousness is often very much split off from the unconscious. Uh, dream work is a way to, to uh, kind of bridge that gap and make a connection internally, and it has a bearing or a ripple effect on how we live our lives and what we do in the external world when there's a split between me and my boss, for example. I'll uh, tell a tale on myself, which I now find humorous, but uh, (laughs) when I first moved to Virginia Beach, which I think was perhaps 25 years ago, I was in a real um, fussy political split, and I was really worked up about the rise of the uh, moral majority. And it really just was getting under my skin. 
And a big player in that uh, community was Pat Robertson. And his operation is centered out of Virginia Beach as well. So I was in a lot of tempestuous, polarized anger about the moral majority and the rise of the religious right in a political context and really, really fussy and twisted in knots about it. And then I had this dream. And in the dream, I'm walking into a really large, um, luxurious reception room. And I'm not sure why I'm there. I walk up this very grand kind of 1920s stairway to a reception area at the top, and there's a big crowd of people. And as I move to the center of the crowd, uh, little Pat Robertson is kind of standing there with a big smile on his face, and he sticks his hand out and he shakes my hand, and I like him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the dream maker evokes this human warmth uh, between me and this object I was splitting around constantly. Yes. And it's one thing to know that you're splitting. It's another for the self to force me to have a sense of human warmth towards the object that I had created so much storminess around. And it released uh, an enormous level of tension inside of me. I may still have my own ideologic tensions or things that I believe are better or worse for society, but it really did diffuse this exaggerated fantasy I was having about this particular public figure. Right. It moved you out of this state of kind of dogmatic certainty, which is always inflated, by the Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Because we've, we've split off shadow. And I love this idea about the dream being the thing that can sort of on a daily or nightly, I suppose, basis, invite us to heal our splits. I, I think that's that's just right. And, you know, we were talking a lot before about Klein, and of course, uh, Freud also wrote about splitting. He um, felt that uh, splitting could be caused by a trauma. Splitting was a major mechanism in hysteria, which he studied. Um, but Jung also incorporated the idea of splitting a little bit differently than these other theorists. And we've already mentioned this one. Debbie brought this up, the split between consciousness and the unconscious. But Jung also talked about the, a split being sort of the hallmark of a neurosis. And of course, we get split off when we get into complexes. Complexes are an example of a splitting in the psyche. In fact, in one place, Jung talks about the neuroticizing effects that happen in, in our culture because of the splitting of the individual and the world in general. And then he says, we just will not admit the shadow, and so the right hand does not know what the left is doing. I'm thinking about you bringing Freud into this discussion, and uh, even though he wrote about splitting, and so did Jung, and we're talking about it, uh, Freud and Jung had their own split of these two giants of the burgeoning psychoanalytic uh, movement uh, had a rift in their relationship that was permanent after having been very, very close collaborators for a number of years. And we've, we've talked about Jung and his difficult years following the split with Freud that were also the basis of all the richness of his later work. But I'm going back to how, how human it is of us to have internal splits and relational splits and probably you know, cognitive splits, too, that lead to us taking these very seemingly righteous positions on issues. You know what that brings up for me, Deb, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up about the, the split between 
Freud and, and Jung, and of course, from my perspective, I suppose I have a kind of um, Jung-centric view on that, but it seemed like, um, you know, Freud could not tolerate any disloyalty to his ideas, and and so he kind of had to cut Jung out, so I think Freud was really splitting there, and Jung, I think, tried to reconcile with that in some sense for the rest of his life because his later writings are just filled with kind of these almost one-sided conversations with Freud. But it also makes me think of all the schisms that have happened in Jungian institutes. I mean, here we're supposed to have a handle on our psyches and our projections, but this is not unfortunately an uncommon occurrence in Jungian institutes that there comes a disagreement, people become entrenched, they take sides, and oftentimes they can't bridge the gap, and the institute splits, and it can be extremely painful, extremely painful for the people involved. Absolutely. So that kind of takes me into where the archetypal roots of this uh, may lie. And um, you know, we were mentioning the the mythical god Janus, uh, who is depicted as having two faces. Our calendar names the month of January for him. So uh, he's kind of the god of this or that, of of duality, of of doorways, one or the other, having two faces. Face each facing in an opposite direction, a- and so I think this tendency to split um, is actually transpersonal in some respects. Well, when I think about certain internal conflicts feeling intolerable, and yet we live in a world that requires us to be functional, to survive to keep our families reasonably intact. The various ways that the human soul has developed to keep us up and running, and that splitting, as well as dissociation and other primitive defenses, come to the forefront to keep us moving forward in at least the most basic ways. And I think the fundamental capacity to split, as you were saying, Deb, is there because it is an archetypal potential that allows life to move forward when no other option seems to be available to the individual. I'm thinking about Jung's idea that the psychological symptom at any point is the psyche's best response to the given situation at that moment. Deb, I'm appreciating you bringing up how archetypal this is. And even before Freud wrote about splitting, the 19th century was full of uh, literary examples such as Oscar Wilde's Portrait of Dorian Gray Mm. or Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or Dostoevsky's The Double. And any time that we have this theme of a doppelganger, we're in this realm of splitting. The two parts of the personality have come apart. And of course, that is a very common theme in film. I'm thinking, and there's just scores of examples. Um, I'm thinking of the Black Swan as one or Vertigo by Hitchcock. So clearly, this is very deep in the psyche. And it was also the basis for um, the Manichaean religion, uh, to which I'm sure I'm not going to do justice at all, but uh, there was good and evil. And I think, um, if I may stretch that into today's world, I think in many of our Western religions, there is also that split between uh, good and evil, God and Satan, So this archetypal tendency that we have to split really undergirds religions and our psychology 
it's bigger than we are. And according to Jung, uh, the path of individuation has to do with being able to hold at least two truths at the same time and to be able to reconcile the opposites, which doesn't just mean uh, shades of gray. I would just mix the black and the white and um, you'll come up with something more subtle. It, it means being able to hold these contradictions about things that really matter. Mm hmm. Uh, relationships that really matter, value uh, contradictions that really matter, and holding the opposites and coming into a, a kind of union or relationship between the opposites is the hardest work I think we ever do. And that does have to loop back into what you were talking about, Lisa, about shadow of what do we do with our shadows? So it seems like it's timely for me to share again this quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn that I know I've read before on the podcast, <laughs> but it's such a, a lovely quote, and it, I think, speaks to what we're talking about right now. If only it were all so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And Jung, of course, asks that we be whole. And being whole requires us to mend the splits in ourselves. I find myself thinking about what motivates us to heal the split. Whether it's the split in the culture the split in our family, the split inside of ourselves. The word neurosis actually means suffering. I mean, that's the fundamental meaning of it, although it's come to be associated particularly with the suffering that splitting causes. And one of the things that I think happens with splitting when it's a primary way of moving through the world is that it creates a background field of fear and anxiety, which often for people is nameless. When we're overly positioned on one side, our entire nervous system becomes hypervigilant. Mm -hmm. We think that we're being vigilant against the enemy that we've finally named or created. But actually, it's a fear that's derived from the distorted thinking, which gives us a sense that we're constantly in the presence of unpredictable circumstances and unpredictable strangers. In order to split, we have to split our memory of things. And when we split off memories... We strip things that are familiar to us of the feeling of commonality, the feeling of kinship. And when we strip those positive memories away, we turn familiar objects into strangers. And living in a world where suddenly I'm surrounded by strangers that I cannot tolerate and cannot understand creates just an enormous feeling of disturbance and distress in people. And when that comes to a certain pitch, we would hope that people would begin to question what they're doing or how they're contributing to this state of misery and fear. Yeah, I think that's really well said. You know, it's like purity is somehow needed to maintain the split. So you use that term vigilance. It can almost become paranoia. And you're right, it's draining. And that's just exactly where we started with Melanie Klein in the schizoid paranoid position, the either or. It's more subtle, or at least, and it appears more thinking related 
but I do think that it is very much a variation on that same theme, uh, that one thing leads to another, the fear and anxiety, which is nameless and in the background, causes us to become vigilant and hypervigilant, to, to split off the good side. Uh, then we lose the feeling of kinship and communality. And then uh, we're, we're into that sort of uh, uh, paranoid place where we started out in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to go back to my hypothetical example about the mom with the boy who needed to go on medication, which, which by the way is sort of, you know, I made it up, but it's sort of based on some stories that I actually know of. You know, the mom needs to cut off her sister or or not talk to her sister or have less contact with her sister. So there's that there's that cutoff place. You know, then you're in a fortress with your certainty. I like that a lot, the fortress of certainty. Splitting allows us to be there. And I think when we are ensconced in these fortresses, we lose contact with empathy. That the people outside of the fortress are no longer perceived as people with thoughts and feelings and a history, a history with us and a history without us. But instead, the people outside are objects that are feared or hated or impinging on the fortress. And then when we turn people into things, then they're treated as something that needs to be attacked, perhaps can be damaged or used up like a resource. But we don't perceive people as being capable of feeling hurt or being injured by our behaviors. So the fortress really distorts the sense of reality outside of the walls, which can justify all kinds of really dangerous behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's rigid. It's a rigid defense because we have to work to maintain it. We have to continually you know, if we're, if we're going to hold on to it, we have to continually be splitting this stuff off, projecting it into the other person and then rejecting or castigating that person. So we have to sort of do ongoing sweeps of the perimeter of the borders of our defense. And it, it doesn't allow for just a kind of spontaneity and open-heartedness. No, it takes a tremendous toll on us uh, and deprives us of those, as you say, open-hearted aspects of ourselves. It deprives us of our humor and goodwill. We can't do it to the other, whoever that might be, without also doing it to ourselves. Exactly. There's a price to pay. I want to go back to this image of dreams as the medicine, because I think they are they, they are the bridge. They are the offering from the other side of the in, internal chasm that can reflect to us, just like your dream did, Joseph, reflect back to us where something's out of balance, where too much has been disavowed and split off. And they're an invitation to mend the split. It strikes me that mending the split is also a very complicated, delicate, and in some ways alchemical process. Sometimes in New Age circles, people will make a kind of clever statement that because I dislike somebody who's doing something, then I must secretly want to do that exact same thing. And I find that that superficial way of trying to discover what I am disavowing doesn't really open up the process adequately. That we have to walk around the thing we find intolerable 
in a circumstance, in a political movement, in a person, and look beneath the surface to the dynamics that are being played out in order to find dynamically what is the thing that makes me intolerably anxious or rubs against a deep childhood wound that is so painful that I have to push it away. And it's in lowering down to the other levels that I think we have any hope of creating a thread of relationship to the thing that we don't want to know. You know, I think it's important to take a moment to note that we often split off things that we don't want to know, but sometimes we split off positive aspects of ourselves that we can't tolerate for one reason or another. And then that might get disavowed and projected into someone whom we then idealize. I think sometimes this can be seen in fairy tales where there's a, a sort of like a true bride and a false bride kind of set up. There's a lot of fairy tales of that type. And one of the brides is the good, the good, the pure, the beautiful, and she's often the real princess. And then the false bride is maybe her greedy, rapacious, uh, conniving, often ugly, and usually she's a servant. And it, it's an image of two aspects of self that have become separated. And we can sometimes find it hard to know the good parts of ourselves as well. And then we project that onto someone else, perhaps it's a mentor or an analyst. And that person holds that projection for us for a while, hopefully uh, helping us to take it back when we're ready. I think you're making such an important point, Lisa, uh, that we can also split off and, and project onto someone else our positive qualities, our own initiative and creativity, talent, possibility. And since all of these things are all wrapped up together, <laughs> When we're, when we're splitting off what we think of as uh, unattractive or unworthy things in another, we're also splitting off some of our own positive capabilities. That as much as we want to separate things into good, bad, and right, wrong, we're losing some of our own libido and possibility. Uh, in whatever we split off, both positive and seemingly negative. I'm finding myself thinking about how is it that people split off their positive qualities and what are the dynamics in the family and the intrapsychic dynamics that might lead to that? One of the things that comes to mind, which I've seen clinically, is that children that were raised with intensely narcissistic parents find that as they were bringing forward their various interests, joys, nascent talents, that when that would evoke tremendous envy, in one or both of the parents, that envious attack on the child's potential would cause them to split that quality off in favor of staying in rapport with the parent. And that can create a kind of underground treasure trove of possibilities, but that's guarded by this feeling that if they were owned, they would be abandoned or that they would be attacked. It creates this incredible kind of Gordian knot in the psyche of many people. And it's just as important to heal those splits as it is these others that we've been talking about. Finding the gold and finding the darkness 
are both necessary to reweave the original personality, to bring it together so that we have some hope of returning to our individual destiny. And and finding wholeness. And finding wholeness. Mm. And I think we may have just come to the time where we might move on to a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing, and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you, and it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible, about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. It's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because (laughs) although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers that needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. (laughs) That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be (laughs) missed. (laughs) It's having a life of its own, which is just what we want. Today's dreamer is a 31-year-old woman who is a college student, and here's the dream. I was in a room full of people, not sure where or with whom, but I suppose they were all friends of mine. I was walking past the couches of people, and I stumbled upon this table. Underneath the table was a head of a person who looked a lot like Sigmund Freud, I approached the sort of floating head and said, you look a lot like Sigmund Freud. He was smiling at me greatly and he said, that's because I am. Then his head disappeared like a ghost disappearing into a wall. I jumped back, gasped and looked around the room to see if anyone else saw what I just witnessed. No one had, they were all busy talking and so I just stared at the spot where his head was trying to make sense of what I saw. Now, for context, this person writes, I recently added the psychology major for my upcoming senior year. I had plans to go to grad school for psychiatric genetics. Though I've been struggling in where I should go for graduate school as I fear the gap between a hard science and soft science will restrict me in what I can do research in. And the main feelings in the dream, I felt really comfortable when I was talking to Freud. His smile was reassuring But after he disappeared, I felt shocked and tricked almost. And finally, she adds, when I approached Freud's floating head, I thought nothing about this was strange. It was as if I was approaching a normal person. Only when he disappeared did I realize that something was off during the whole encounter. Well, I think it's really funny that when she first encounters the talking head, it seems really just fine, but it's only when it disappears that it seems alarming. Like I would imagine that the initial encounter might be alarming as well. It is a kind of humorous dream. I mean, it's, it's we were all kind of chuckling at it. And, and I that is a very common aspect of dreams that we probably don't lift up enough on the podcast because dreams can make us laugh. Yep. I am uh, having the same reaction that you guys did of how, how charming this is that, you know, there under the table is a floating head that this happens to be Sigmund Freud, and it feels perfectly normal. 
But I'm thinking about what's under the table, and I uh, kind of went to this place of how we can be paid under the table with income that we don't have to declare. Uh, so that here's sort of a, a way of saying it. it's a freebie. And uh, she comes across the resource, so to speak, of psychological uh, knowledge and foundation of a lot of psychoanalytic theory. And yet, in real life, there's the debate between uh, the hard science of, of genetics, I guess, and the soft science of psychology. And there's some concern about that, but it, but it feels kind of comforting to be talking to uh, Sigmund. I'm also wondering all of a sudden if Freud represents a symbol of the transcendent function in as much, in as, much as Freud was a neurologist and a medical doctor and, a, and for his time a hard scientist who also developed this soft science of talk therapy. So as she's holding this double major of microbiology and psychology, it very well may be that Freud is kind of the patron saint of holding those two, what might think of as polarities, but holding those two positions successfully. And if that's true, that the disappearance of the head of Freud might create a sense of anxiety because it's the loss of the integrating image between those two tensions inside of her. I, I think that really feels right on to me, Joseph, of that while he's there, even though the head is split off from the body, uh, the dream ego feels the connection. And then the split is when somehow he melts into the wall and is gone. And there's also a split between sort of what's above board and what's under the table and her own real world struggle in uh, where she's going to go and what she's going to uh, uh, commit to with her graduate work studies. A and wh where is the unifying principle? Where is the glue? Where is the connection between all these various kinds of splits? And she verbalizes that a bit in the context. I fear the gap between a hard science and a soft science will restrict me. But it's fearing the gap, which is a wonderful way of talking about the anxiety around the split. <laughs> you know, I think I'm, I'm struggling to try to articulate something along these lines the way that in many parts of our culture, perhaps particularly in mental health, there's a disregard for, well, let's call it the unconscious. I mean, I think that mental health has always struggled with being overly um, material in its view of mental distress. This is, this is nothing new, but uh, that kind of polarity continues and here she's considering this this hard science that's going to be concerning itself primarily, I would assume, with a kind of uh, biological model of of suffering. And there's another thing. There's another viewpoint. There's another perspective. It's under the table. I mean, Joseph, I appreciate what you said before about uh, Freud kind of embodying both. And in our current culture. Freud is often considered to be, well, he was important in his time, but we've moved on, we've learned more. And of course, many people are profoundly interested in Jung, but many others distrust him or find that he was mystical or are dismissive. So is there room for both? Is this other way of viewing things allowed? And even when we try to dismiss it, it pops up under the table. I'm holding that feeling of under the table. 
I'm thinking about uh, all the stuff that goes under, on under the table. Uh, people will give each other a little kick, or lovers might reach across and stroke the other's calf. Kids might pinch each other under the table. People fumble with their napkins or do little comforting things with their hands. Our genitals are under the table when we're sitting at the table. The lower halves of our bodies are kind of cut off under the table. Children hide under tables sometimes when they're playing. The dog will sometimes wander around under the table looking for scraps. And in some ways, shadowy association, doesn't it? I'm also aware that it's just his head. So I I wonder (laughs) a bit if this person might take a very intellectualized approach to these matters. Yeah, Freud is a talking head here, quite literally. Mm -hmm. So if we lean into just the head of Freud under the table, that could be you know, a metaphor for rationalization and over-intellectualized process, which is in some ways in the shadow that she gets a glimpse of by looking under the table, catching it from a distance. So from the standpoint of shadow that we were talking, is it an opportunity for her to become aware of the overly intellectualized way that she's holding her process moving between being a hard scientist versus being a psychologist and that she gets just a little glimpse that perhaps this is not an embodied question but perhaps even a disembodied question and once she begins to see that she's holding this in an overly intellectual way, which is a defense, and defenses generally are calming in the beginning, when the overly intellectual defense pops away, then she's left with the anxiety of the direct experience that there's something in her body that wants to chime in, that has an opinion about these decisions. And that leans back into what you were saying, Lisa, about needing to have some input from the unconscious, some input from the irrational in terms of her finding her footing and her Mm. way. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.